I feel like when we talk about trades in baseball, the fleeces always get brought up first. You know the trades I'm talking about. The Rays swapping Chris Archer for a haul from Pittsburgh, Fernando Tatis Jr. for James Shields, the Braves swinging Dansby Swanson for Shelby Miller. But I want to swing things to the other side of the spectrum. I want to talk about the best win-win trades in baseball history. We had one this last offseason, where the Marlins got hit King Luis Arias and the Twins acquired starting pitcher Pablo Lopez, who they just extended. Speaking of those Marlins, Marlins, they also got franchise face Jazz Chisholm, while the Diamondbacks on the other side got bona fide ace Zach Gallen. In a perfect world, this is how every trade would go down in the sport. So let's look at the best of the best and how those players fared before and after. Guys, if you enjoyed today's video, make sure you leave a like and subscribe to the channel. Also ring that bell for all future notifications. I want to first start off with the best modern example of this in my opinion. For this trade that happened in 2021, I think we can all agree that both sides came out much better for it. After a disappointing 40 game stretch to begin in 2021, the Rays finally decided it was time to cut bait on shortstop Willie Adamas and hand over the keys to their top prospect, Wander Franco. Adamas always cited vision issues as a reason for his poor home hitting splits at Tropicana Field, so a trade was the best course of action for both sides here. Adamas had been good, not great, throughout his three years as a Ray, but a change of scenery turned out to be exactly what he needed to ascend to stardom. Tampa Bay flipped him to Milwaukee, where Adamas quickly became an integral cog in the Brewers lineup. Milwaukee was 22 and 22 exactly a 500 record when they acquired Willie Adamas. After the trade, they went 73 and 45 the rest of the way, a winning percentage of 62%, and they ended up winning the National League Central Division. Adamas, of course, was a huge reason why, clubbing 20 home runs with a 137 OPS plus in the final four months of the season. He's kept it up since, remaining the best overall hitter in the Brewers lineup and starting off 2023 strong. But the Rays obviously won on their side of the trade as well, as is their reputation. In return, they got two arms from the the Brewers pitching surplus in Drew Rasmussen and J.P. Firehydrant. Uh, uh. JP Fireisen. The latter is no longer a member in the organization, but in his two years in Tampa Bay, JP was absolutely lights out in the bullpen, including 24 and a third innings with zero earned runs allowed in 2022. But the big piece of this haul has to be Drew Rasmussen, who has quietly blossomed into one of the most dominant starting pitchers in the American League. He's managed an ERA under three in over 200 innings during his time at the Trop, and has been a constant for the Rays with injuries to other starters like Tyler Glasnow and Jeffrey Springs. Though the Brewers could obviously have benefited from a guy like Rasmussen in their rotation, they're still pitching really well with starters like Corbin Burns, Brandon Woodruff, Freddie Peralta, and even a resurgent Wade Miley carrying the load this year. They needed the offense instead, and I think both teams came out the other side better at the end of this deal. In terms of the exact breakdown of wins above replacement exchanged, it's pretty even as well. In 2021 and 2022, Willie Adamas was worth 8.0 war, and in those two seasons combined for JP and Rasmussen, they were combined for 6.8 war. Pretty even. Now let's turn the clock back and revisit is it one of those vaunted Marlins sell-off deals? There's a lot of bad stuff in Marlins trade history, most notably trading Miguel Cabrera for a package of prospects that never panned out, but they've had some hits here and there. One of their best trades came in the offseason after 2005. Coming off the heels of their World Series in 2003, ownership committed to yet another fire sale to the dismay of fans everywhere. In this massive roster deconstruction, 25-year-old ace Josh Beckett and cornerstone third baseman Mike Lowell were shipped off to Boston to help them win a World Series of their own in 2007. After a rough first season, Josh Beckett became a Red Sox legend, winning 84 games and striking out over a thousand batters in a six-year stretch, not to mention three All-Star nods, an ALCS MVP award in 2007, and a Cy Young runner-up finish that same year. Mike Lowell also found career resurgence as well, bouncing back from a forgettable final year in Florida to become a key piece of a potent Boston lineup. In a four-year run, Lowell batted 295 and managed a 110 OPS plus and finished top five in MVP vote in 2007, a year where he collected 120 runs batted in. Without this trade, there's no guarantee that the Red Sox would have run away to their second World Series victory in a four-year period. But this is not to say that the Marlins were the sole loser of this deal. In fact, you can argue they may have been the winner. You can also argue that they should have begun a practice of paying and keeping their players, but I digress. The end result was pretty good for them. They got a lot of pieces from Boston, but the main two that panned out in a huge way were star shortstop Hanley Ramirez and reliable ace pitcher Anibal Sanchez. The latter had multiple seasons with over 30 starts and an ERA under four, and also threw one of the many no-hitters in Marlins franchise history. While Sanchez became the ace of the staff by age 26, it was Hanley Ramirez that truly stepped into the spotlight. You could argue that Hanley is still the greatest player in this team's history, and for good reason. He's top three all-time in wins above replacement, batting average, doubles, home runs, and stolen bases in Marlins history. He made three all-star teams, won two silver sluggers, was named National League Rookie of the Year,
year in 2006 and won the batting title in 2009. In fact, I have a whole video on Hanley Ramirez if you want an even deeper dive into just how great he was during his prime. Although Boston got a World Series out of it and the Marlins failed to reach the playoffs again in this window, the war exchange of the major players in this deal is pretty eye-opening. In the end, Boston got 33.1 wins above replacement from their best years out of these two players, while the Florida Marlins got 40.9 war out of the best years of their players. There were a lot of moving pieces in that deal, so how about we simplify things even further and talk about a basic one-for-one -one trade. Back in the middle of 2015, the Detroit Tigers were watching their championship window come to a saddening close, while the New York Mets were randomly catching fire in the second half. With an anemic lineup and desperate need of power, the Mets dealt from their young pitching surplus to acquire a firecracker bat. Now, I know Luis Sessa was also involved in this deal, but the real crux of the trade comes down to two players. First, Michael Fulmer being sent from the Mets to the Tigers. Fulmer would have joined an elite young rotation of Harvey, DeGrom, Thor, and Mats, but instead he led the charge of a new era in Detroit, one that was pretty forgettable. But to Fulmer's credit though, he certainly did his part, winning American League Rookie of the Year in 2016 and serving as the ace of the staff for a fantastic three-year run in Detroit. He managed a 3.81 ERA and 75 games started during this stretch, and though he's transitioned to a bullpen role now, he was a winning acquisition for Detroit. As for the Mets side of things, they acquired Ioannis Cespedes, who propelled them to their first National League East Division crown in nine years when he slugged over 600 in a 57-game stretch in the second half. He was even better in 2016, his first full season in Queens, clubbing over 30 home runs with a 136 OPS+. Plus. He made the All-Star team, won a Silver Slugger, finished top 10 in MVP voting, and helped the Mets to their second consecutive playoff berth. Cespedes went on to sign two separate extensions from there, the former being far better than the latter. But he's overall remembered fondly by Mets fans for his insane power and iconic personality. Surprisingly enough, the Tigers were on the winning end of this war exchange in this trade, partially because of Cespedes missing time and having poor defensive metrics. Fulmer was worth 10.7 war in his best years from 16 to 18, while Cespedes was worth just 7.8 war. But in terms of the playoff magic the Mets got out of their spark plug, I consider this a win for both sides. Speaking of Fulmer, let's keep it going with the pitchers. I think there's a compelling argument you can make that Dan Heron is the best starting pitcher in baseball history to get traded five times. Heron always had ace-like numbers and led several different teams to the playoffs, yet he never stayed more than three seasons on any team throughout his entire 13-year career. Perhaps the most significant move of his career was when he was dealt away by the Arizona Diamondbacks, who were entering a retooling period. Heron had made back-to-back all-star teams in the desert, leading the National League in strikeout-to-walk ratio in consecutive seasons, and even finishing top five in Cy Young voting. He was the marquee piece of the 2010 trade deadline, and the lucky winners of his services were the Los Angeles Angels. Dan Heron was unreal for them in the second half, tossing 94 innings with a 2.84 ERA, including a 1.7 ERA in his final eight games of the 2010 season. Overall, his tenure with the Angels was great, as he led the league in games started, complete games, and strikeout-to-walk ratio in his dominant 2011 season. Though Heron was great and the Angels won over 80 games in each of his seasons there, they were unable to return to the playoffs with him leading the starting rotation. On the other side of the deal, the Diamondbacks brought in a surplus of arms from Anaheim, most notably Patrick Corbin, Joe Saunders, and Tyler Skaggs. Skaggs would find himself traded back to LA in the years that followed, but Saunders and Corbin played key roles for the Diamondbacks in the seasons that followed. Joe Saunders was a reliable starting pitcher for Arizona over a three-year stretch, with an ERA under four in over 400 innings for the Southpaw. Speaking of Southpaws, Patrick Corbin wouldn't come up until 2012, and though he had his ups and downs, he ranks as one of the best pitchers in Arizona's franchise history. He managed an ERA under four in nearly a thousand innings pitched, making two all-star teams and finishing top five in Cy Young voting back in 2018. Our perception of Corbin is obviously very different now during his time with the Nationals, but five years ago, he was one of the best lefty starting pitchers in the game. Corbin ranks 8th all-time for war and earn run average for Diamondbacks pitchers, and is 4th all-time for wins, innings pitched, and strikeouts. In terms of war exchanged by the two teams, this was one of the closest deals I could find. In Dan Heron's three seasons with LA, he had 13.2 wins above replacement. Joe Saunders and Patrick Corbin combined for 13.1 wins above replacement in their tenure in the desert. The last trade I want to highlight today is definitely the most unique of the bunch here, and unsurprisingly, it once again includes those pesky Florida Marlins. This sell-off trade might be more egregious than some of the others I mentioned, coming just mere weeks after Florida improbably won the 1997 World Series. One of the key pieces to completing that run was ace pitcher Kevin Brown, who had just completed a two-season stretch of 65 games started, an ERA of 2.30, 11 complete games, two all-star nods, and a runner-up Cy Young finish. He was arguably the best pitcher in baseball.
baseball during these two years. And instead of paying him the $4 million on his contract, the Marlins decided to cut bait, no pun intended, and ship him off to San Diego. One year removed from a 76-win season, Kevin Brown helped revitalize a beleaguered Padres pitching staff, twirling one of his best career seasons and helping San Diego win their first National League pennant in franchise history. Though he had just one year left on his deal and subsequently signed with the Los Angeles Dodgers, he was worth every penny for the Padres. He accrued 8.6 wins above replacement in 1998 alone, which led all MLB pitchers. This was thanks in due part to 257 innings pitched and a league lead in games started, fielding independent pitching, and home run per nine rate. The Marlins were, frankly, insane for trading away their ace, but got three pieces in return from the Padres. Two did not pan out at all, but luckily for Florida, the third was first baseman Derek Lee, a renowned slugger of the 2000s and a key piece to their eventual return to prominence in 2003. Over a six-year period, Lee hit the crap out of the ball, crushing over 120 home runs and over 150 doubles to the tune of a 115 cumulative OPS+. The unique part of this trade is the war I mentioned before. In one season alone for Kevin Brown, he nearly outnumbered the total war accrued by Derek Lee in a six-year time frame. If not for Lee's strong last year in 2003, one year of Kevin Brown would have been worth more than five years of power hitting Derek Lee. It still ended up close, and both teams reaped the benefits of this trade, and Derek Lee's 9.9 .9 war from 98 to 2003 narrowly outnumbers Kevin Brown's 1998 alone. There are plenty more examples of win-win trades. We'll save those for another day, especially if you guys enjoyed this video. And if you want to see more of this, make sure you leave a comment for any win-win trades that I missed and any other ideas you can spin out of this topic. But before you go, let's hear a word from today's sponsor. Lightbox. Guys, there's a lot of special occasions around this time of year, most notably Mother's Day. And I know we usually go with clothes or flowers and that's all special and good but if you really want to step up your game this year you can go for some lab grown diamonds some absolutely stunning necklaces and earrings over at lightbox if you click the link in my description whether it's for mom or your significant other someone special in your life i highly recommend checking out lightbox's collection of very special jewelry with the link in the description it's diamonds and jewels that you'll love with price tags that you'll understand you can be the mvp of mother's day or your anniversary right now with promo code jolly olive 10 that's my channel name 10 at lightbox right now you can get 10 percent off your purchase click the link in my description shop some lightbox lab grown diamonds code jolly olive 10 you know be the mvp this year give them a gift that they'll remember forever thank you to lightbox for sponsoring today's video and i'll see you guys next time